Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for coming here after lunch. We probably still have some people rolling in over the next few minutes as everyone's getting their coffee. I hope everyone enjoyed lunch. It's great to see so many of you here. My name is Marcus Helberg, but I'm going to talk about Hilla, so I changed my name to Marcus Hillaberry for this specific <laughs> talk. <laughs> now, one of the really great things that I love about being in developer relations is that I get the chance to just talk to so many developers and customers. I remember in Atlanta last year, I went to DevNexus and I spoke to a backend developer who one morning found out that he was actually a full stack developer because his boss came and said like, hey, can you actually also build the React front end for this app? And it was like, uh, maybe. <laughs> um, or like Matthias, where is he? One of our customers, Matthias, I met him in Berlin in our meetup earlier this year. And he said that in Berlin, you can't throw a rock without hitting a TypeScript developer. Now, it's a very unorthodox way of recruiting people, in my opinion. But I think the kind of point stands. Like, there are places, companies, where you just have a lot of front end talent that you might want to be able to pull into a project and get them to do something useful with their lives. So. Uh, there is that. Uh, I remember Lars at the panel yesterday, he said that they have a very specific kind of need to have fine-grained control over their DOM in their application. There are applications where you might have needs to, say, run parts of the application offline, or for some reason it needs to be fully stateless on the server so you can scale it to infinity and beyond. And then there are crazy people like me who just happen to enjoy multilingual development where I like to be close to the browser when I'm doing browser stuff and I like to be in Java when I'm doing backend stuff. And that's okay too. So over the past 20 or some years, we've really shown with Bodden how powerful and kind of productive it can be when we have one team working together on um, building a piece of software in a kind of type safe environment with really good building blocks to do that. So, with Hilla, what we wanted to do is bring a lot of that same kind of set of benefits to all of those developers who, for one reason or another, can't use Bonflow. So for those teams and developers who want to build their application with a backend in Java and a front end in React. So today, I want to work or kind of introduce Hilla by just doing a hands-on start from scratch, explain how everything works, and just show how it works. So if you are a Flow developer, uh, this might not be something that you're going to use personally, but it might be very interesting. You might have somebody else in your organization who are kind of in this bucket of developers or teams who have both front end and back end developers, and it might be interesting to them. Or just as curious developers, it might be interesting to just see how React works if you've never worked with that before. So if you haven't done any front end development in the past 10 years, say, like it has changed just dramatically. It's very much different from the like Wild West days of IE6 and, <laughs> and beyond. So uh, maybe it's just a very kind of interesting thing for you to see how it works today. Um, before we get started, I'm very curious to see how many here have used React in some way, shape, or form at some point in their developer career. OK, so there's 10, 12 people. Great. Hello. Great. OK, so for the rest of you, I'll try to explain what's happening. Uh, hopefully, it's fairly self-evident from the code itself. But um, feel free to put up a hand, ask a question if you feel like you're, I've lost you. So um, I am going to start by creating a new Hilla application. For that, we are using the Hilla CLI. I'm using it through NPX, which is a part of NPM that allows us to run tools that we haven't installed locally. So. I could also, since I have installed this locally, run Hilla in it, but this is something that's going to work essentially on any computer that has Node installed. So I'm going to create a new project called Address Book. By default, this is going to be a Maven project that has a Spring Boot backend and a React front end. So we can go into that new Address Book, and we can open that in our ID of choice. I prefer IntelliJ. You might choose anything else except for Vin based on yesterday's poll results. So we're going to do idea and open the folder like this. Now, 
when this loads, uh, I need to load it as a Maven project. There's a weird new feature in IntelliJ where it somehow optimizes Maven project. So if I create a new project with the same project I had before, it loads weird. So I just need to like tell it twice to load it as a Maven project for that to work. Who knows why? Why don't you attempt to? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So if we look at what we have here, we have a source main Java folder, your plain Spring Boot application. There's an application class right there that we can run. And then we have a front end folder which contains our React application. We can run it from here. Another IntelliJ peculiarity, and this is uh, courtesy of my friend Josh Long from the Spring team. He added a new feature in IntelliJ by asking for it nicely, which is on frame deactivation update classes and resources. So what this does is it, whenever you go from IntelliJ into the browser, it recompiles and triggers Spring Boot DevTools. The problem is that with Hilla, we already do that. So by the time you get to the browser, it already shows the new stuff and then it reloads again, which is highly annoying. So <laughs> we're gonna sort, sort out a better way uh, to handle that. But for now, let's hit play and see what we have. So this is just running the plain Spring Boot application class. And when it runs, it's gonna build the front end dev bundle and hopefully if everything goes well here, we will have a application with just a hello world here. Now, since I wanted to start from scratch, I am actually going to go and just delete all the boilerplate that's in here and we're gonna literally start from scratch. So I'm gonna delete all the components and utilities and views and routes, none of that take that away. It's gonna get very angry at us because we took away stuff that it needed. So we're gonna go here and, and remove the imports. And now we have one React component called app. So this is the entry point to our application. We can return some HTML here. So let me do a, a div with an h1 inside saying hello world. And that's gonna update immediately. So with React you have a really nice hot module replace, very quick dev cycle here. Now, I personally have a kind of a pet peeve with elements touching the browser window or not being aligned. So we can add some of those same utility classes that Yuzo was talking about in Luma. We can use them here as well. So we're gonna say class name here and we're gonna give padding medium to it. And that's gonna push it out a little bit here. All right, so then if we start building out the actual application, as you might have deduced from the app name, we're building the classic address book application. For that, we're gonna have a contact uh, entity that we're gonna persist in the database. And then we're gonna display that in a grid. We're gonna be able to like select people from there and update them. So kind of a CRUD application, if you will. So for that, I'm gonna use the database that Simon didn't like, H2, of course. So we're gonna do uh, H2 database here and we're gonna do spring boot JPA. Found out this by accident, so if you just kind of type in something that's roughly the dependency name and wait for a second, it just figures out what you need, which is pretty cool. All right, so we have the backend dependencies here. I'm gonna create a new class for our contact. So let's put it in a data package, call it contact. We're gonna turn this into an entity this, all right, and I forgot to hit the little Maven reload button here. So we'll wait for Maven to pull in all the dependencies and then we can import that. For this talk, I'm gonna use GitHub Copilot and also ChatGPT to generate some code so you can also get a feel for how that works. Uh, I'm gonna do a talk on how to actually use AI like as a part of the application later, but ooh, that's a lot of stuff. So let's do an ID and uh, generated value here for a private long ID. Then we'll have a private string for a first name. Okay, I need to do import here. And then we're just gonna do very simple like last name, email, phone number. We'll need an empty constructor then we wanna have a constructor that takes in all the basic values here. Let's hide the sidebar. And then we need a kind of basic getters and setters for everything. 
Now, I want to have some uh, test data just to work with. So for that, I'm going to go into chat GPT and say, like, I have this entity. Uh, please create a command line runner in Spring Boot to create five demo contacts with realistic data. And then we're gonna put that in backtick so it knows that's the kind of code. Hit OK, Let's see if that works. So I use this for a lot of just like boilerplate code. It, this is something I could write, but also just coming up with a bunch of names and phone numbers and stuff is not super interesting or kind of worthwhile. <laughs> uh, so again, it, like it assumes we have a repository, which is good because I also forgot to do that. So while it's generating that code, we can go in and create our repository here. Another tip, IntelliJ tip, not Hilla tip, is if you copy a full class and paste it on top of the, the sidebar here in a package, it's gonna create that file for you as well. You don't have to like first create the file and then paste it in. So if you're a lazy coder like me, that's very great. I'm also gonna import, um, implement the JPA specification executor for a cool new auto grid feature that we have. So that's just gonna help us do filtering and sorting and other stuff. So basic JPA repository, we get CRUD uh, functionality from there. And now we have this command line runner, it says demo data configuration. It returns a bean configuration of a command line runner with demo data. And this looks fine. It's, it's good enough for what we need. So in you go, we'll go there. And now we have a backend that's kind of good for what we need here. So now we're getting to the actual Hilla specific thing. So I'm going to create a service that we can use to access our backend from TypeScript. So I'm going to create a new class here. We're going to call this our uh, contact service. And contact service will extend from a list repository service. So this is something that we just added with uh, Hilla 2.3. This takes care of just exposing some basic list and filter and sort methods so that you don't have to do that yourself. So this is going to take in a couple of things. You can see T, I, D, R makes a lot of sense. So we'll have a type, which is the contact. Its ID is a long, and its repository is a contact repository, like that. Now, in order for us to be able to call this service from TypeScript, we need to add an annotation on this called browser callable. So a class that's browser callable can be called from the browser. Makes sense. By default, they're all kind of deny all. There no no access to a service unless you give access to it. These are Spring Data or a Spring Security role, so you can add either class level or method level restrictions on who is able to access stuff. For this demo, we're not going to start setting up Spring Security, but that's basically a standard Spring Security setup. Now. The list repository service is already going to give us everything we need to list and sort and filter and do stuff. But I want to have one method that we can use to save things. And the way I'll do that is I'll do a public method that returns a contact. And that's going to be called save. And hopefully this understands what I'm trying to do. Yes, it does. So it essentially gets the repository instance and calls save on it, returns whatever the saved object is. So that is good. Now we did a bunch of stuff like the command line runner and added the database instance. So I'm going to rerun my application here. So we get all of that set up. And I'm going to close that. And hopefully we now have, again, a running application here. And that means that we can go into React and start building out the UI. Now, we have the same set of components available to us in React, just that they are now declarative tags instead of uh, components. We have the same utility names as, as you saw already earlier. The way React works is that you have functional components. So you have essentially a JavaScript function that has the name of whatever component you want to have. It returns a template, which is the structure of the DOM you want to return. And this template should be a function of a state. So there's a separation between how you want to lay out things and what the state of a component is. And what React does is whenever the state changes, it re-renders the template. So you don't have to like specifically keep 
uh, references to buttons and text fields and stuff and update their values whenever some changes. You always kind of calculate that uh, based on your state. So we'll start with the new auto grid that we just added in Hilla 2.3. This takes in two things. One is the service that uh, implements list service. So that'll be our contact service. And you can see that I can auto complete that here. So Hilla already generated that TypeScript service for me. It also takes in a model, which is kind of a model definition, like what are the both the properties of this object, but also some more in-depth information like validations and stuff that we're gonna look at later. So this will be a contact model. All right, I'm gonna close that, hit save, and that's gonna give us a grid that has filtering and sorting and all of that stuff. And that goes all the way now down into our database if, if needed. Now, of course, here, this is not maybe a very realistic uh, case where I like directly hook up my re uh, repository to the UI for simple applications. That's probably very okay. But you can also extend just from, instead of list, serv uh, list repository service, you extend from list repository and then you can just override that uh, logic, how it actually fetches the data. Okay, so what I wanna do next is select a row in the grid and display that in a form so we can edit it. Now this is unfortunately one part where the client side grid isn't nearly as fully featured as the flow grid. So you can't actually select a component directly. We have to help it out a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is define a React state that tracks what is the selected component at any given point. And the way that looks is, this will look really weird if you've never done React. So I'll type it out and then try to explain <laughs> what the heck's going on. So I'll do a const and call it selected and a set selected. And this is gonna be a, what we get back from calling use state with a contact or null as its type. So this looks really weird. And what is happening is we're calling use state to say like, hey, we wanna have a state in our component that is of type contact. And that's gonna return to us a array of two items. The first is the actual variable that we wanna bind. And the other is a setter. So whenever we use the setter, React knows that we've changed the value essentially. So the uh, array syntax here is just us destructuring the two elements of an array into separate named variables. Okay, so once we have that in place, what we can go and do here in our auto grid is define a listener. So we can say on active item changed, we wanna do something, we'll take the event there. We'll do a fat arrow. So again, in Java, that would be a single arrow and JavaScript double arrow. We'll call the setter. So set selected selected value, come on, seclude, what? <laughs> set select. Yes, okay. And then we're gonna take the detail value here that you can see is typed. So the, the grid component knows the type of whatever it's, is in it. And we're gonna pass the value there. And let's see what is. Oh, yeah. So for some reason, and, and you also please take notes now. <laughs> for some reason, the grid value can be either undefined or null, and it's very particular that you need to <laughs> handle both cases. It's, uh, as a developer, I don't really care if it's undefined or null, so this works. So now we are storing the selected value into this uh, item, and then we need to pass that back to the grid saying that it's selected items is equal to a one item array of selected. So hopefully in a future Hello release, we can just bind directly to the selected item but for now, this is what we do. So we can verify that we have this selected item here by interpolating a value. So if we do brackets like this, we can put JavaScript or TypeScript in here. So we can say that uh, selected dot first name, and that's gonna print that out here. The question mark here means that it's essentially doing a null check for us. We don't have to like check if it's null and then do it. It's just not gonna blow up. So we can see now whatever we've selected shows up here. Okay. So it takes a little bit of 
getting used to like this reactive mode of thinking, like how do I define the template as a kind of a function of that state. What I wanna do next is create a second component for the form where we can then bind the selected value and pass in a save function. So for that, I'm gonna again open up my sidebar here. I'm gonna create a new file here, contact form.tsx, like this. And I'm gonna do the exact same thing. So I'm gonna export a default function called contact form. And this is gonna return some sort of template. We can say, let's do a, a div for now, just so it compiles. Um, what I wanna do then is I wanna define the interface of like, what are the properties you're able to pass here? So I'm gonna define a interface called contact form props. This is gonna take in two things, a contact, which will be of type contact, and we can import that again. And then the other thing I wanna pass in is a function for what should run when we save. So we don't wanna have this call our backend directly because then that would be limited to where we could use it. We wanna be able to have the parent component decide what happens whenever we save. So we're gonna have a unsubmit method that's gonna get in a contact and uh, GitHub Go Copilot did a pretty good job assuming what it's gonna be. So it's gonna return a void, but it's actually gonna be a promise of a void. So empty promise is all we can <laughs> give. Uh, this is because all the communication with our backend is going to be as asynchronous. We're not gonna block the UI from updating as things are happening in the backend. Now on localhost, things are fast. In the real world, they're not necessarily, we don't want the UI to be stuck just waiting for the backend. Okay, so once we have those, we can say that the contact form should take in as its parameters uh, a contact form props. Now, I only interested in those two values there, so I can actually destructure them with this syntax. So again, with curly brackets, I can pull out certain properties from a JavaScript object into named variables directly on uh, like this. So that means now if I go into my app here, I can start using the component. Now we already have the selected component, uh, selected contact, which is the first parameter. The second one is the on submit method. So we can define that as a async function. Uh, let's call it on submit just so it's exactly the same. And this will take in a contact and do things. All right, so when we submit the value, what we wanna do is of course call the uh, backend service. We wanna get the updated value and then we wanna uh, update the selected value here. So we're gonna say const saved is equal to contact service dot save. So you can see the, the way we're calling the service is with the exact same signature as we would like if we were calling it in Java. Of course, this is a, looks more like a static method in, in Java, but that's more of a kind of a nuance difference here. But we're using this await keyword here to essentially wait for that promise to resolve. So when JavaScript hits await, it essentially just puts this on the task queue and whenever it's done running other stuff, it checks if it's done. If not, it just keeps doing other stuff until it is done. So that way, again, our UI stays running. Once we have that, we're gonna update the selected value like that so that the correct line stays uh, selected. So once we have that, we can go and uh, add it to our UI. So what I want to happen is that if we have a selected person, we show the form. If we don't have a selected person, we don't show the form. The way we can do this is by, again, having this uh, curly brackets and we're gonna say selected and and, so essentially, uh, inline and operator. So if, if it short circuits with that uh, being a false value, it's not gonna render. If it's true, then it's gonna render this. So we're gonna do a contact form. Uh, the contact will be our selected value and on submit will be on submit like this. And then we need to of course close the tag. There we go. All right, let's see if this works. No, what did I do? Mm -mm -mm. 
What did I do wrong? Okay, well. Let's do some debug stuff here. Exactly, okay. That's why you don't do stuff in different order. <laughs> All right, so at least one person is paying attention. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so of course we need to implement the form. Okay, let's put something in there just so we can see. Yeah, okay, it, it does show up. So what I wanna do then in our form is implement it because an implemented form works better than an unimplemented form we have learned today. And what I'm gonna do here is use the use form hook uh, that Hilla provides. So that's gonna look something like this. We're gonna destructure a couple of things out of it. So we'll have a field that we can use to bind uh, UI fields to a model. Then we have the model, which is a definition of what the properties are. Then we have a submit method for submitting the form. And then we have a read for reading and a value. And this is all something that we get from calling use form. Use form will take in a contact model and it takes in a properties object. I'm passing in the on submit method here. Again, in TypeScript land, saying on submit is equal to saying on submit is equal to on submit, which is a little bit redundant. So, it might be a little bit kind of weird to read at first, but that tends to be a little bit shorter and, and nicer on the eyes once you're used to it. So now we have a kind of all the pieces we need to build a form, which means that we can start putting together all the, all the different uh, fields that we need. So I'm gonna use a text field. I'm gonna say the label is equal to first name. And let's see if this figures out what we should do. It does. So then we use the field to bind it to the first name property of the model. And you'll see that this is typed so we can see what are the actual properties that are available here. So we'll do the same for last name, email. Come on, you can do it. Text field, label phone. Yeah, there we go. And then we'll have at the last thing a button that's gonna call the submit. So again, we're saying on click is gonna call this submit from the form, which is then hooked up to whatever we passed in. We'll save that, we'll see what happens. Okay, so now we get some fields visible here. They're not looking very great, so let's take care of that. We're gonna go in here and use some class names again. So we're gonna do class name equal to grid, grid calls two. So two column CSS grid, gap small maybe. Yeah, looks nice. We'll give this a theme primary, make it blue, good enough. So I, I enjoy the really quick turnaround, just type in stuff, it shows up immediately. If I do something wrong, I, I know, like 200 milliseconds later and I can go and fix it. So the one thing that we haven't called yet is this read. And since this is a functional component, we wanna somehow react to that. So essentially we wanna define a side effect to our purely functional component. We do that with a use effect hook that looks like this, it takes in a function that gets called whenever anything within this array changes. So in our case, we're interested in changes to the contact and that should call read with the contact as a value and boom. So just save that uh, hot module replaced. We can see the value populated here. And if we did everything correctly, when we hit submit here, that's gonna call the save here and that's gonna go to our backend and all the way to the database. So let's change change Jane to Janet, hit save. Doesn't work completely, but let's go ahead and refresh. Sure enough, it's there. So here's another little uh, thing that we're still improving on the uh, auto grid that we just released is that we need to tell it that, hey, something outside of your scope changed. So we're gonna do a, another cool React pattern. So we'll have a update count and we'll let uh, Copilot update that, so we'll have an update count. Whenever we save, we're gonna incre increase that and then we're gonna set the uh, refresh trigger. Yeah, that's the name. 
to the update count. So it doesn't really matter, like as long as you kind of poke this value uh, with a new value, it's gonna update. So now if we change this, hit save, you can see that it actually updates right here. And you also noticed that since I changed the name, it re-sorted uh, the grid. And if I have, say, if I have a active filter and change something that's gonna apply immediately. So it's pretty cool. We have a single state that's the source of all truth and everything in the template is only derived from that. Now, one really cool thing about the form here is that it allows us to have a shared set of validation rules that we define in Java that are going to be enforced in the client and again, back on the server. So let's go ahead and just define a couple of things. Like in real life, you probably would put these on your DTO, like say like, requirements for calling my services that these things hold true. So let's do a size here, maybe min three, let's do min two. I know people with shorter names than three, so it's not great. And then we'll do a email. These are Jakarta standard uh, validation, so nothing, nothing hill specific. Gonna save this and what's gonna happen is that that model that we had will get regenerated with more information. So. If we, I don't know if you're able to see that, but there's now a little required dot here. So if I go and take the value away from there, it's gonna show up as an error. Sim similar if I have an invalid email address here, that's not gonna work. Now, I don't know, you also you can probably have an opinion on whether or not this is good, but one thing you can do is you can also pull in the state here, or like is, is the form in a valid or invalid state, and, and you could disable the, disable the button anytime it's, the form is invalid, so then you can't submit it when it's invalid. And again, you don't have to like manually call this from every place where you might change the value, it's all automatically derived from the state. All right, but I know we have senior developers here, you're like, huh, I can, never trust anything happening in the browser and people are just gonna hack that anyway. So let's do that ourselves. We're gonna call the server. We're gonna, let's do this, make that a little bit bigger. We can see we called save with, uh, with that and we got this. And we're gonna be very cool hackers and we're gonna copy this as a fetch call and go into our console paste it in there and then we're gonna change the values to something that's valid. So like a one, one letter name and a email without an at sign and then we're gonna hit save. All right, so we got a 400 from the server. The server is not happy with what we just did. And if we go in here, we're gonna actually see what it sent back to us. It's like, well, these two parameters are not good. They are not accepted. So not only are we able to kind of help the user fill in the right things in the client, but we're taking care of like the kind of sort of redundant but very necessary check when you get back to the server. Yes, sir? Yeah, yeah, so you can, well, for the sake of what we're doing here, we're gonna go, and let's do to our contact here, let's do message, uh, let's see, first name must be, Marcus, it seems like a Marcus or <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> so now it should hopefully, uh, let me see. Yeah, first name must be Marcus. So that might probably be a localization key or something if you uh, have a localized application, but yeah, you can, you can change those differently. Um, what else? I think that's, pretty much all I wanna get into in this intro section. Uh, what is really cool with Hilla is that you can not only return basic data types like we did here, but you can also return reactive data types like a flux. We actually have 10 minutes, so I might actually, let's do that. So let's, uh, who here is not familiar with the flux data type from the kind of spring reactor library? Okay, we have a couple people, good. So a flux is essentially a sort of a stream, it's something you can subscribe to, say instead of us calling and getting like, hey, who's online right now? You could say like, hey, anytime 
there's a change in who's online, just send me like an updated list of people, for instance, and then you can, in your client, subscribe to that and just, again, react to that happening. So let's do a public uh, flux of strings. So now we can subscribe to some random uh, strings here. I don't know, let's just get some names here. Okay, so now this GitHub Copilot wants us to send out all the first names and we can do like delay elements by a duration of one second. Okay, so now we have a way of getting names every second it's gonna return one, one more name from, from there. So if we build this and go into our application, application here, what we can do is define a use effect again and we're gonna call our contact service, get names, on next. So we're gonna say like on, on next name, we can do something with that. Now we don't have a state for that, so let's do a const uh, names, set names is equal to a string array, sure. And then we can say whenever a name, we're gonna set the names to previous, let's do And I'll explain this in just a second, what's happening here. So we have now all those names coming in. We'll do a, and just map those to a unordered list. And now you can see they're getting pushed to our client as they're coming in. And because the UI is reactive, again, it's gonna uh, display those. So what's, what's happening here, like this is again, weird TypeScript syntax, you may think. We're using a different uh, method of this, or variant of the setter, which takes in a update method. So it gives us the previous state at any given time and allows us to modify it. What's happening with all of this code right here is that we're creating a new array, that's the brackets. We're putting all the elements of the previous array and we're putting a new array. The reason we're going through all of this trouble is that the way React handles change detection is it's looking at the actual instance of an array, it doesn't look at what's inside the array. So we're working with immutable data types. So we need to create a new array instance. And this is probably the most compact way of doing that. There are libraries in TypeScript that can make this read a little bit better, but I think after a while, most TypeScript developers just read this as, as kind of normal. Okay, um, so really, Hopefully what I was able to show you is that with Hilla we've been able to kind of bring a lot of the same benefits that you've enjoyed as Flow Java developers over the years to teams who for one reason or another prefer, like, need to build an application where they're combining a React front end with a uh, Spring Boot back end. And that's it. Thanks so much for coming. I'm gonna take, we have a bunch of questions uh, or time for questions here. So if you have any questions, Please, please feel free to ask. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question is that could you use Spring REST controllers and would they get introspected by Hilla? So the answer to the first one is yes, you could use uh, REST controllers for if for some reason you need to kind of call some legacy code, you're maybe migrating an application or something. They would not get introspected by Hilla. So the kind of type safe uh, RPC style communication is dependent on being in a browser callable service. De yeah, I mean, I'm trying to make sure that I don't say wrong things, but you might be able to put a browser callable on your REST controller and <laughs> sort of work, but it, like the, they're, they're gonna be very different because when we're working with Hilla services, we're not really too concerned about what verb is being used or what parameter, how it's getting serialized or stuff. That's not really where, what, we wanna stay more on the kind of business logic thinking level on, on, on building things, so. 
so it's slightly different. The idea is that you, like it's more of a backend for front end thinking where you would create a browser service for whatever view you're building and then internally that might call whatever other services you have in your company. So typically you'd probably be authenticated to your application and then you could pass the same token around to other services. I, I believe that's what you're uh, doing in your Hill application as well. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? Can you do an IDE debugging? Can you do IDE debugging and client side code? Uh, yes, you can. So it requires you to launch the browser through IntelliJ or whatever IDE, and you can put the breakpoints in there. You can, I, I, I personally use more this as, as the debugger. So if you go into the sources folder here, you should have source maps for everything. So you could have a, <coughs> breakpoint here and if you now go ahead and refresh this it should hopefully break there. So you can do that in your ID if you prefer. Um, typically I again prefer to work more with browser tools and for browser stuff and uh, but because it does have uh, source maps you're looking at the actual like react code instead of whatever the compiled code looks like. Yes. Mm -hmm. How much does he need to learn before he is productive? I, I mean, at a bare minimum, I guess nothing really. They need to be able to call. Uh, I, I mean, one of the things I really like about Hill is that when I'm building something like this, I can just go like, what was that? Sir? Oh yeah, it was contact service. What, is, what did it provide? Oh yeah, it has all of these things. Uh, typically when you're building a React plus Spring Boot application, the way you're doing this discovery work is you open up your REST like Swagger documentation or something in the browser and then you're browsing through and seeing what, uh, what you have there, what are the URLs, what parameters does it take, what are the verbs and so on. Whereas here it's I, I think more discoverable because you can stay within your IDE and discover APIs and how they're meant to work. So uh, I, I believe maybe you could I, I don't know if you have had a chance to work with developers who are purely from a React backend, but you have. So maybe you can have a. And yeah, and the React application is a standard React application. There's nothing like Vaughn specific about it, except for for the like some of the helpers we've added, and they're of course opt in. We think they're good and help you be more productive. But you could like use any third party React components. You could build your own components. You could take all of the knowledge you have of React development and apply it to this. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Which makes sense to um, see React, but not the body components, but I know React components that the developer knows. And so would it make sense to use another set of components? Perhaps. I mean, if you're in a in a project where like your company's already using a design system that's something else, and you want this to fit into there, you can certainly do that. Uh, Tatu has an opinion on this. I can see. Yeah. 
then you, I, I put plus plus calculate. If you would come and use hello mock, uh, then you see some other defined which can have this comprehensive enough for your application. Because you will have trouble mixing those defined things. They may be a third party components that are neutral add ons that is different there. Yeah. All right, thank you, Toto. We're running out of time, so I'll ask you. <laughs> Great. We'll take it outside. Yeah. All right, thanks, Toto. Um, I see there are a couple of more questions. Let's take them in the hallway so we can get the next uh, speakers ready for their talk. So. Thank you so much for coming again. Uh, great seeing you here. Thanks.